Hello, welcome to another STAT 3D5 video. In this video, we're going to have some fun. Uh, so this is the moment in the semester, and it aligns perfectly, almost too perfectly, with real-world events. That is, we're going to talk about baseball. Um, so apologies to folks who aren't big baseball fans, um, but this is kind of a big interest of mine. And there's a lot of great data that is publicly available and easily accessible that we can practice dplyr, tidyr, ggplot2, that is the tidyverse with, and that's what we're going to do in this video. So um, in some sense, this video isn't strictly necessary. Um, if you're an in-person student watching this because we had a cancel Friday class, um, you might want to skip some of the beginning, although it wouldn't hurt to watch it again and see what we do at the end, which is some more quote unquote advanced uh, analytics. Okay, so... Um, and again, if, if you're not a baseball person, that doesn't matter. Um, you will still sort of be able to um, understand what's going on from a coding perspective. And, um, you know, maybe next week we'll do different data that's not baseball, but I sort of can't help myself. I'm interested in this. Okay. Um, because I'm on YouTube, I can't show you copyrighted material, of course, but um, there's this idea in baseball called Moneyball. So 20 plus years ago now, the uh, Oakland Athletics sort of popularized this idea of using statistics and analytics to uh, manage a better baseball team. And at the time, it was sort of about um, having a limited budget and, and, and using that budget to perhaps compete with the team spending a lot of money, kind of like the Yankees at the time. Uh, but nowadays, because everyone's doing Moneyball, you kind of have to do it. And, you know, it's, it's um, a lot of folks in statistics and data science. Um, well, I would say, sorry, not a lot of folks in statistics and data science go work in baseball. Sorry, that's not true. They go work all over the place. Uh, but a lot of baseball teams are hiring people like statisticians and data scientists. Sorry, I'm just seeing if I have the... So uh, this book by Michael Lewis called Moneyball, um, it, uh, it kind of outlines this idea. Also, there was a movie in 2011 uh, written by, uh, what, Aaron Sorkin, starring Brad Pitt, Jonah Hill, and various actors playing baseball players um, by the same title, Moneyball. Uh, I sort of linked to <clears throat> one of the scenes from that movie. Again, can't play it here, obviously, but... Um, oh, sorry. Pause. Don't get ahead of myself. Uh, this post you see here is on my website. I will link that on our course website, though. Um, and it'll contain all of, if not all of, and probably some more code than what I see in this video, because it's kind of going to be a lot of code. So unlike some other videos, I'm actually going to reference it for you. But anyway, um, if you haven't seen the movie, maybe pause this video and quickly watch this video. It will sort of give you a sense of where things were at the time and give you sort of a brief introduction. Um, one of the things that happens in that video is that uh, Jonah Hill's character introduces this thing called the Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem of baseball. Technically, he doesn't call it that in the movie because for general audiences, they would probably be um, lost by that. And this is just a very quick uh, screen cap I took from one of the scenes in that video I linked. And um, this equation here uh, is something that we're going to implement uh, in this video and then sort of graph graphically validate that it is a reasonable thing. I'll explain when we get there. Okay, um, and then another thing I should say is that um, I and others at the University of Illinois are sort of engaged in um, baseball analytics in a variety of different ways. Um, I'll make some comments about that at the end of this video if it doesn't drag on too long. Uh, for those of you that are interested and might wanna get involved uh, in some of that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. So again, um, this uh, post you see here is currently on my website, but again, I'll link it on our course website and it's kind of under construction, uh, but I wanted to get it out there so that as you're watching this video, you could sort of reference some of the code along the way. Don't be surprised if it changes and gets better. Like some of the plots right now don't have titles and access labels, which, you know, I don't like. So obviously I'm going to fix that, but I just wanted to get you something uh, to work with along the way. Okay, cool. Let's jump in. So um, I'll, I might reference this a few times, mostly for my own sake, um, because I might need to, because I'm going to be doing a lot of code, so I need a reference, but I'll try to do it from scratch like I always do. Okay, cool. So let's jump over to our studio, something like this. Okay, so 
inside my SAT385 project, I made a new folder called Moneyball, and I sort of created two scripts here that don't really have anything, but just um, uh, they're named after the two different data sources we're going to use. So we're going to use something called the Lamin database and then something called Statcast. Um, and then this data folder, we'll talk about that when we get there. Okay, so we're going to start from sort of like the very, very basics of baseball data, then sort of introduce a little bit the Moneyball idea, and then uh, we're gonna take a big leap forward to modern day statistics uh, in baseball. We might even, so technically I'm recording this video a day after opening day, I'm actually missing the White Sox game right now. I hope Lance Lynn is still doing well. It was 1-0 when I walked away. Um, we might even look at some data from opening day 2023 on the fly right here, right now. Okay. But that we'll have to wait. Okay, so I had previously sort of mentioned, uh, oh, I forgot to sort of have it ready to go to show you, but basically this idea that there is data sort of in some sort of storage format, we then want to pull it into R and sort of a programming representation. And then we want to make sort of uh, human representations of that data, or maybe not human representation, but analytical representations, be it uh, human readable plots, uh, visualizations or models. Pardon me. Um, we're not going to uh, model. Well, actually, we're going to kind of do a, a naive model if you think about it. But so this first thing I want to do is I want to acquire and create and sort data about um, the all time home run leaders in MLB. Um, uh, this exercise was a little bit more relevant last year because uh, those of you that are following baseball, there were sort of two uh, home run milestones uh, last year we had. Um, we had Aaron Judge set the American League uh, single season home run record, and we had Albert Pujols um, uh, break the 700 career barrier. Now, unfortunately, the data we're about to look at is a season lag, so it's only up to 2021, but let's have a look. Okay, so we're just going to go ahead and load the whole tidyverse. You don't necessarily need to do that, but we mostly need dplyr, ggplot2, um, tibble, and we might need tidyr, but I'm not sure. Okay, but so um, the data that we're gonna look at comes from something called the Laman database. Uh, I believe it's technically called the Sean Laman database, um, uh, named after the person that sort of has collated over the years, although um, there are more people behind it uh, in my understanding. Um, but one of the reasons that we use it in R pretty often is because there's a package that just gives us access to all those things as data frames, and there's not much to worry about. So there's not much data import to deal with here, later on though. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and load that package. If you haven't installed it before, you'll need to, uh, but it's Lamin with a capital L, that's important. Um, and then this DT package, um, um, capital D, capital T, um, we might use it here. Um, that's mostly for how I presented it on the website, um, but uh, I'll make a comment about that. Because um, basically, obviously data frames are already kind of like a table format, but when I mean table, I mean something that can maybe be displayed um, in a nice manner on a website or in a PDF or su stuff like that. This package makes nice sort of like sortable, uh, nicely styled tables for websites, and that's why I'm using it. Okay, let's get started. So um, even though I loaded the package, I'm gonna type lawman colon colon, and the reason I'm gonna do this is because it brings up the autocomplete and it shows me all of the objects within this data set. And so for the purpose of STAT35, this is great because obviously this is multiple data frames and a lot of them have a way to link them together. So, um, you know, if you're an online student, you already watched the video where we talked about joins, this is gonna be, you know, practice doing that because we're gonna join information across multiple tables here. So the tables that we're gonna be interested in here are the batting table, uh, and I actually don't need to do this, so like that, um, but this is printing as a data frame. And so what I'm gonna do really quickly, just for printing purposes, is coerce it to be a tibble, like such, and I'll give it the same name. Uh, I technically don't need to do this, but it'll just make our life a little bit easier. Uh, so it looks like this. Again, I'll come back and talk about this in a second. Um, another table we're gonna need is the people table, and I'm gonna coerce that in a similar manner. Uh, and then um, I want to explore a little bit the Hall of Fame table at the very end. Okay, so just run those again, make sure I have them all. Okay, so batting looks kind of like this. Um, I'm zoomed, maybe, 
I'm gonna try to zoom out one. Hopefully that still works. Uh, just so it's easier to see some things because we got a lot going on. Uh, oops, people looks like this and Hall of Fame looks like this. Obviously, I don't expect you to understand everything that happened. Maybe pause, look at those things yourself, check out the documentation, um, but what, I'll explain what we're gonna be here doing. Okay, so what I'd like to do, without looking at the data, I'll sort of like state my purpose here, is I want to, f I want to get data about the all-time career home run hitters. So um, look at the total number of home runs players hit in their career and then i want to have that information sort of uh from uh most to least and then uh if i can i also want to pull in are they a hall of famer or not because you know you'd kind of think well if you hit the most home runs in baseball you should be in the hall of fame that celebrates the best players of the game spoiler alert that's not the case we'll talk about why when we get there if you follow baseball, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But for those of you that aren't aware, we can give you a little bit of American history. Okay, cool. So let's take a look at this batting table. And so what this is, it's it's statistics about players' uh, seasons uh, by player. So what I mean by, well, it's actually more specific than that. So this is arranged by year. So we have data going back to 1871. Uh, but for the purpose of maybe, you know, bringing things into the modern age, Let's um, look at this from uh, the most recent year. Oops, what did I do wrong? Uh, arrange, descending, oh, capital D, I believe. Okay, cool. So what a row of this data is, is a player year team combination. And that's a bit of a gotcha on one of the quiz questions, I think this week, where you need to realize that this is not organized by player season. It's organized by player season team because players can get traded mid-season and play for two different teams. And those are shown as two different rows. Um, excuse me. That won't be important for our purposes in this video, but it's something to be aware of. So, and then, um, so for each of these, um, Let's see, I think this here is Jose Abreu of the Chicago White Sox. So it looks like he played in 152 games, 148 hits, 30 home runs, um, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so realistically, actually let's, let's focus on uh, Jose. Um, pretty sure that's him. That's a question, wait, how do I know? We'll get there. Um, but so let's say, um, it's got to be because that's Chicago White Sox. How do I know that? Well, we could also talk about that, but we might skip that part. Um, sorry, I want to filter to player ID equal equal this one. Right. So um, our goal essentially is for each player in this data set, I want to sum up the number of home runs uh, that they have. So I could do this really quickly for Jose Abreu here. I could say summarize. Uh, home run equals sum of home run, right? So that's going to sum up uh, the number of home runs he hit. And so uh, this tells me, excluding last season, uh, he had hit 228 home runs in his career in Major League Baseball. Um, in theory, he played somewhere before he came to the Major Leagues. Okay, so, but that's just for one player. I want it for every player in this data set. So if I didn't filter like this, what this would do is this would sum up all of the home runs hit in Major League Baseball from 1871 to 2021, and it's uh, 316,009. That's a lot of home runs. Okay, but I want this for each player. So this is where we can use the buy argument here. Um, oh, by the way, online students, in a previous video, I probably used the group buy argument. But as of a couple months ago, instead of using group by followed by a verb, you can now within the verb use this by argument. I would highly recommend you do this. Um, so this will be sort of your introduction to that as well. Oh, and another thing, if in the previous videos you watched about dplyr, you, I used a different looking pipe, I would highly recommend you start using this one. You'll see the old one a bit more, but everyone is transitioning to this one now because it is well, not everyone necessarily, but um, it's built into the language now. And they've also sort of made some improvements to it even after adding to the language. And I would place my bets on this being the future. So I would go ahead and use it this way instead. Um, you can modify the setting in our studio that changes which one uh, gets used by default with the keyboard shortcut. OK, but anyway, so I want to do this by player ID. 
cool. That looks pretty good. And actually here we see that one example that we did. So it's good to check our work. And then obviously we care about the people that have hit the most home runs, right? So let's do uh, a range uh, descending by that new home run metric. Okay, so <clears throat> an exercise we did in class was to, was to sort of like check um, if we had baseball fans in the class and see how many of these players they could figure out based on the number of home runs they hit and their uh, player ID, which it kind of hints at their name, but you can't 100% get it. But uh, see, this is Barry Bonds. Uh, this is Hank Aaron. This is Babe Ruth. This is Alex Rodriguez. This is Albert Pujols, which after the 2022 data is released, he will leapfrog um, Alex Rodriguez. Um, it's Willie Mays, Ken Griffey Jr., Jim Tomei, uh, played for the White Sox. Sammy Sosa, also played for the White Sox briefly. Um, and uh, Frank Robinson, right? Um, and we could go on, we could print more and look at that. But uh, for, the, for the baseball fans that are like, yeah, of course, like everyone knows who those people are. But for the non-baseball fans, you're like, um, excuse me? Like, these are, these are just random letters and numbers. How do I know the name of this player? So that's where the people table is going to come in handy. So here we see that this table has a number of things, including the player ID, um, which is going to be the primary key here. Uh, but then we'll also have um, first name, last name, given name. So actually, let's let's take a closer look at that and say, let's just look at uh, player player ID. And then I want to look at name first through name given to see what sort of information I'm in. Okay, so cool. Um, okay, it looks like name given is first middle. So, excuse me. I think we ultimately are mostly interested in the first name and the last name. So what I need to do here is I need to join these two things together. And again, um, we sort of talked about this in a previous video, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, if not, this will be an example of it, but I'm not going to break it down uh, super detailed. Uh, but so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to say left join and remember, so basically everything up to here, all these manipulations did, that's going to be the, the, the data frame that we're joining another data frame to. Uh, and that data frame that we're going to join is the people data. And then I would sort of recommend always specifically specifying the column that you're joining by. Um, otherwise, it'll sort of tell you which one it auto automatically guessed, but I would always specify it. Uh, and we want to do it by uh, player ID. Um, thankfully, it's named the same thing in both um, tables. Otherwise, we'd have to use a slightly more complicated syntax. Okay, let's have a look at that. Uh oh. Error in by. Do I have to quote this? That shouldn't be the problem, right? Oh. Oh, yeah. No, that makes sense. Okay, cool. I always kind of forget where you're allowed to unquote it and when you're not. I figured it out. Okay, so um, this kind of brought in more information than I really wanted, right? So I think what I'll do is I'll say select um, player, well, play for now player ID. I might modify this to make it look nicer in a bit. And then uh, can I steal that? Oh, no, I got rid of it. Uh, so what do we want? Name, not at. Sometimes autocomplete doesn't do exactly what I think it's going to, and I get a little excited. Okay, cool. Um, oh, I should probably retain the home run information or this whole exercise is useless. There we go. Um, okay, cool. Um, one thing I might do real quick is from the tidy R package, I'm going to use the unite function. Um, let's see if I remember how to do this. So we're going to unite name first through uh, name... Uh, last, uh, I always forget. Uh, wait, no, I think, so I need to give it, oh, okay, sorry. First, I need to tell it what the resulting thing is going to be called, which is name, and then it's going to be based on these columns, and the way we're going to unite them is with a separator, uh, and that separator is going to be a blank, well, actually, a, an actual space between the two names. Okay, so here we have Barry Bonds, Hank Aaron, Babe Ruth, Alexander, I was right. Okay, cool, but you know, that's expected. All right, so we're making a lot of progress. We see um, what's going on here. But now let's, let's have a look at this Hall of Fame data. So 
in baseball, there is this thing called the Hall of Fame. Um, it is both kind of uh, an honorary thing and a physical location in Cooperstown, New York. I've never been there. But anyway, it's considered like the highest honor in baseball, um, where some number of years after you retire, a group of people called the BBWA, a Baseball Writers of America Association. Basically, it's sports writers, well, baseball writers specifically vote on is this person someone we want to quote unquote vote into the Hall of Fame? And it's a very, very, very high honor and only so many people get in. Um, there's also, as of recent years, something called the Veteran Committee who can override them later on and it's a whole thing. And um, long story short, this is the thing that baseball fans spend all day arguing about and it'll really come down to something we'll see in a moment. So um, this data is actually not specifically who is in the Hall of Fame. It's actually more than that. It's about votes that have happened to get into the Hall of Fame. So um, if we pull back up this data, let's look at Barry Bonds, for example. So if I take the Hall of Fame data and say filter to player ID is equal to Barry Bonds player ID, you'll see here um, six instances of him being voted on. Um, and uh, you might notice that there's this inducted column and that's whether or not they got over the threshold of, I forget if it's 70 or 75% of the writers have to vote them in. Um, well, actually here, wait, while we're here, uh, let's do mutate, um, we'll call it percent is equal to votes divided by ballot. Uh, and he got up to, 56.4, one of the last years that he was on the ballot. Um, so the threshold is somewhere above there. Um, I wanna say it's 70%, but that's not important for our purposes. But you might notice that he never got inducted in the Hall of Fame, despite hitting more home runs than anyone else. Um, baseball people know exactly why this is for the non-baseball folks in the room. It has everything to do with performance enhancing drugs and it is a whole long story. Uh, we're not gonna get into it here, but basically there is this now forever argument within baseball of did players cheat, yes or no, by using performance enhancing drugs. It's a whole thing. It's undecided. People have very different opinions on this. I'm not even gonna state mine, uh, but long story short, yes, despite Barry Bonds having the most home runs hit of all time, he is not in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Okay, cool. But that's fine. Um, but for our purposes, we want to use this data here and um, get it down to one row and then simply, yes, they have been voted in or no, they have not been voted in. We don't care um, about all the details and all the variety of rows. So I think what I should be able to do is say, uh, so this should be a summarize, I would think, right? Uh, and we'll say um, in hall is equal to, um, let's see, so uh, I can work with this vector here. Um, can I say, I've written this code, but I'm blanking on how I did it and there's multiple ways to do it. Can I say any uh, of the inducted Equal, equal, yes. Uh, I'm missing a parenthesis maybe. Oh, but I need to do this for each player, so I need a buy argument here. Um, so buy player ID. Okay, so that looks good. Um, I'm. We can check this a number of ways, but let's do this real quick. Let's summarize um, n equals n by um, in hall okay so we have 323 people in 956 people out so that means that of the people in this data set and i honestly don't know if it's complete or not there are 323 people in the hall of fame as of 2021 i have no idea if that's true this might not go back in time far enough and then there's also been 956 people that have appeared for voting but not got voted in i'm realizing i need to start going faster or this video is going to be very long but hopefully it's interesting okay but anyway so what we really want to do is we don't need this. That was just for me doing a little bit of checking. And there's no reason for this to be two lines. I could do this, you know, that's just how piping works. So real, realistically, this is now a data frame that we want to join with what we've already done. 
So what I can do is say uh, left join with, uh, let's sort of space this out a little bit, this stuff uh, by player ID. Let's see if that does it. No, 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 no. What did I do wrong? Oh, I keep forgetting. I, I keep forgetting I have to code it there. Okay, cool. This is correct. Okay. Why do I, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's correct as of 2001 modulo any missing data that I'm not going to check right now. But basically, so here we see Barry Bonds is in the Hall of Fame. Hank Aaron is, oh, whoa, hold on. Barry Bonds is not in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> That's what people argue about all day. Hank Aaron is, of course. Babe Ruth is, of course. And then we have these NAs as well. Um, and that's because, well, well, Albert Pujols, uh, he just retired after 2022. Um, I think if we had the 2022 data, Alex Rodriguez would be false in that he had finally been voted on for the first time in 2022, but uh, he did not get in for similar reasons to Barry Bonds. Um, we see uh, Willie Mays, Ken Griffey Jr., uh, I don't know about William Mays, but Ken Griffey Jr. was a, what's called a first ballot Hall of Fame. He got voted in the first year he was eligible. Uh, Jim Tomei is in. Sammy Sosa is not. Again, for the same reasons as Barry Bonds. Um, just for fun, let's maybe uh, print further down here. I want to see how far we get before it's someone that is not in the Hall of Fame, that has been voted on, that is not somehow linked, either allegedly or not, to uh, performance-enhancing drugs. So let's see here. Um, Mark McGuire, not in, same reason as above, him and Sammy Sosa, you know, you could argue they saved baseball's popularity when I was a kid, um, uh, in the late nineties, they were hitting home runs at amazing rates. They set records before Barry Bonds came and set records, uh, single season records that is, um, oh, Rafael Palmeiro, same reason he may or may not have lied about it in front of Congress. Again, I don't know what the truth is, but that's, you know, the story there. Reggie Jackson is in Manny Ramirez. Same story there. A pattern is emerging. Mike Schmidt is in. Oh, uh, here's an N.A. that um, would be converted to true if we have the 2022 data. Um, although some people would argue that, that David Ortiz got named on the same list that leaked to Sammy Sosa, alleging performance injury rights. Clearly, this is a contentious issue. I don't have an opinion. Um, okay, and then Mickey Mantle is in. Here we go. Frank Thomas. Go White Sox. Um, also a player from the 90s era of uh, performance enhancing drugs, but was never accused to my knowledge. Um, Gary Sheffield. I'm actually not sure. I think maybe he was linked. Don't know. Um, Miguel Cabrera just retired. Um, he all there's a lot of milestones last year. Uh, last year he crossed the 300 hit barrier. Um, and then I believe Fred McGriff got voted in last year from the Veterans Committee. Okay, anyway, um, there's that. Now, um, I'm not gonna go through it here, but on the website, you'll see when I did this, it prints us this nice sort of table, right? Uh, and we can sort by home runs here. I, I, I kept it at 100 and above. We can sort by uh, Hall of Fame status. We can sort by name. Hey, AJ Pruszynski hit 188. Uh, there's a White Sox everyone everyone likes, except for Cubs and a lot of other teams he played against. Anyway, um, go White Sox. Um, right, so there's that. And how am I doing that? Well, that's with this data table function from this DT package. Uh, so what that does is it takes the data frame and it converts it to an HTML table with a little bit of JavaScript on top. And I tie that all together with something called uh, Quarto to create this website. Um, I should say more about that later, but this video is gonna get too long. I wanna stick to the um, things that we actually are learning about right now. Oh, hey, look, I did this slightly differently here, but that's another way um, to do that. Okay, cool. Let's talk about the Pythagorean theorem of baseball. So um, in this scene, um, Billy Bean, is played by, well, not in this scene, but in a scene that precedes this, Billy Bean is played by Brad Pitt. Uh, and this character, that's that's Jonah Hill's hand there that you see pointing. He's playing a character called Peter Brand. Um, I forget which of this is history and which of this is like stretched history. But long story short, Billy Bean was the general manager of the Oakland Athletics. And long story short, they didn't have as much money to spend as other teams like the Yankees. Of course, you have to name check the Yankees there. Okay, so um, 
I forget if this is fictionalized or not, but he met Peter Brandt, who was working for the, at the time, Cleveland Indians, now Cleveland Guardians. Um, and this scene is sort of Peter Brandt taking him through some of the analytics that they'll be using. And one of the things there, so when, when he, when he, he does the whole baseball thinking is medieval speech, he says, you shouldn't want to buy players. You should want to buy wins. And how do you buy wins? with runs and there's this formula that we're looking at here that basically it's a formula that says here's how many runs you score in a season here's how many runs you give up in a season and you can use those numbers to predict what your winning percentage is going to be and we'll, we'll look at that equation in a second well it's actually this exact equation but so this 841 here is runs and this 645 is runs against so that's how many runs you give up um and then so you know we're obviously going to see the whole procedure here but like then you would sort of seek to to acquire players that could you know and estimate how many runs they would get you how many runs they would give up etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's and we want to ask the question is that true like does that actually work out that way okay so um here is uh, a little bit of a reference about this on baseball reference um if you find yourself being interested in uh, baseball analytics, you'll probably find yourself on two websites pretty frequently, baseballreference.com and Fangraphs. Um, I'll actually mention Fangraphs a little bit later when I mention one of my colleagues. Um, well, our work has been featured there and his work was on their podcast recently. But anyway, so um, sort of one of the people who really developed this idea of Moneyball, um, before that it was kind of called the Sabermetrics, is this uh, person named Bill James. Uh, and he came up with this thing called the Pythagorean Theorem of Baseball. And it looks kind of like this. And we're going to go ahead and check it out. Does it actually work the way they say it works? So the way we're going to do that is like this. Okay, so there is this Teams data frame inside of um, the Laman package. Uh, it'll look like this if you print it. Um, let's let's do this. Let's uh, coerce it to be a tibble so it's easier to see. And then we'll say teams, uh, and then I want to arrange it by. Actually, let's just let's straight up filter it to um, year ID is twenty twenty one. This is the most recent season in this. Okay, so here we see ten rows. Makes sense. There's 30 teams and there's 20 that are not printed. Uh, and so here are my White Sox that year. Uh, they won 93 games, lost 69 games. Pretty happy we're looking at the 2021 data and not the 2022 data because for the White Sox fans out there, we did not do as well in 2022. 81 and 81. Okay, but anyway, so um, another thing you'll see in this data is this runs here, so that's a total number of runs they scored that season. And then there is this, uh, it's here somewhere, runs against. So to look at this, let's do this. Uh, let's do um, select uh, year ID, team ID, uh, wins, nope, comma. Comma wins, comma losses, comma runs, and comma runs against. We don't really need losses, but okay. So now what I can do is I can apply the Pythagorean, excuse me. I can apply the Pythagorean theorem of baseball. So to do so, it's a function of these two things, right? So make a new variable that's a function of two other variables. That's a mutate. Uh, so I'll call it uh, pi, how do you spell Pythagoras? Spelling is hard. So pyth w uh, percent, because it gives us the winning percentage. So what, did it, what was it? It was runs squared divided by runs squared plus runs against squared. Okay, so there we have that. And then if you know anything about baseball, there are 162 games in a season. So to get the estimated wins from win percentage, we would do, um, so another mutate, and we would say Pythagorean wins is 162 times uh, that thing we just calculated, which was this. Um, and then we don't have to do this, but customarily you should probably round that because you can't win 95.9 games. I don't know how that would happen. Um, so it looks like this. Okay, and then we can kind of see 59 versus 52, 96 versus 88, 52, 52. Ooh, Baltimore, I'm sorry. Um, see, Baltimore would have much preferred I could include a 2022. But anyway... Let's just look at this, right? Time to plot it. 
so we'll pipe this to ggplot. Uh, on the x-axis, we'll put um, let's put the true wins on the x-axis and the estimated Pythagorean wins uh, on the y-axis. And then uh, let's plot them as points. <laughs> hey, that looks pretty good. Uh, let's uh, change the theme because I very much just like that one. Uh, and let's maybe go ahead and add a, uh, how do you say, uh, a smoother. Um, and let's go ahead and that, that looks like a pretty beautiful uh, linear relationship there. So let's do... Um, Method is a linear model. This part, this exact part, unless you've taken 425 or 426, you know, don't worry about this too much. Um, and then I'm also going to specify the formula just because otherwise uh, it'll bark at me and say, hey, this is the formula we think you want, but I'll just say this. Minus title, subtitle, caption to say data source and fixing up the um, axes names. This looks pretty good. But this is only for 2021. What if we want to do this throughout history? Okay, so rather than uh, filtering to 2021, let's do from, uh, let's not do everything because it'll be so much clutter on the graphic. Let's do from 1990 onward, roughly when I maybe started watching baseball. Um, I won't reveal what age I was at that time. Okay, cool. And we see this. And mm, that doesn't look as good, right? Something... Something is up here. What's the deal with this? And we pause and we think and we go, this is one of those cases where data visualization just like, it shows us so quickly that like, hey, something is up in this data. Now, if you didn't know anything about baseball, it might be a bit tricky to figure out what on earth is going on here. Right, because you know you see that there's an issue with the pattern, but then you'd have to like dive in and try to find it. Um, and this is one of those things where this is a great demonstration of if you have some knowledge of the domain that you're working in, you can go a lot faster sometimes. Um, so for all of us, there was a season in recent memory that was a little bit different than the others. 2020. They did not play a full 162 game schedule. They played all of 60 regular season games. Uh, and I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that is represented right about here in the data. So we're predicting far too many wins compared to what actually happened because we're assuming a 162 game season. Now, uh, worse, worse yet, oh wait, no. No, sorry, that's this over here, right? Yeah, no, sorry, this is the COVID season here pretty sure. Um, but another sort of similar thing that has happened in my lifetime, maybe not yours, was in 1994, there was a labor issue and the players went on strike and the season just kind of stopped midway through and there was no World Series that year. And as a White Sox fan, especially a young White Sox fan that I was, that was devastating because that was one of the best White Sox teams of my lifetime. Um, but hey, I got to see 2005 so no complaints. One of the most dominant postseason performances of all time, but I digress. Okay, but if you're not a baseball person, you, you want to be like, well, prove it. And even the baseball people, let's see just how uh, much that appears here. So um, let's sort of ignore the plotting for a moment. And I get rid of that. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to create another variable in this data set that is for um, what I'm going to sort of call like season type and there'll be three types there'll be normal there'll be a 1994 strike season and a 2020 covid season right so to do this we're going to use that um we're going to do a mutate uh what i what i say it uh season type uh and we're going to use um the case win function okay cool so if i've done if i remember how to do this so if so basically, what, I believe the syntax, if I get it wrong, we'll look at the documentation. But so if year ID is equal to 2020, I think the syntax is this. We're going to say um, COVID 
uh, no, COVID, sorry, COVID is all caps. Cause it's an acronym, right? Coronavirus disease, I think, right? I should know these things, but that's not important. Okay. Uh, and then if your ID is, what did I say, 1994, uh, then we say uh, that was a strike, 1994. Uh, and then uh, I believe the syntax is, you say default. I think this is the new syntax we're doing in this case one, but uh, we'll call this normal. Let's see. No. Uh, this is good because it gets me to look at the documentation. Um, oh, okay, so it's... Well, hey, that makes sense. Okay, cool. So here we see that. Um, and now I'm going to assume that works correctly. And those other ones are in there for the appropriate years. And now, but so what we can do with this is, okay, so now we pipe it in here. And what we'll do is we'll say um, color. I don't know if it, I always forget if it's color or fill, but, you know, I'm guessing check. Um, color is based on the season type. Beautiful. I was exactly correct. And this plot shows us that. And we see, hey, look, that linear relationship holds within those three sort of groups. We can do one better though. Um, because this whole this whole notion of multiplying by 162 here was kind of silly. Because within the data, if we go back. One of the variables is number of games played. And if you know anything about baseball, there haven't always been 162 games. So thinking back to the home run stuff we were doing, um, so last year, Aaron Judge hit 62 home runs, breaking Roger Maris's American League record of 61. Here, we're sort of ignoring Barry Bonds in the National League. But um, so that record, Roger Maris's record, was very contentious because he set that record uh, I, I'm going to get my story mixed up here, but I believe so Babe Ruth had hit 60 or something like that or 59 or whatever. No, 60, right? Well, we could look that up, but in the interest of time, that's an exercise for the reader or just check baseball reference. I should know these things. But anyway, um, Roger Maris uh, set the 61 record in one of the one of, the, if not the first 162 game seasons. So there haven't always been 162. There was 153 before that and some really early seasons there wasn't. But so what I'm getting at is, well, we have the number of games played by season. So what we could do is, sorry, we could simply retain that information. And then rather than multiplying by 162, multiply by the number of games. And then when we do this, it all works out perfectly. Um, well, not perfectly, but beautiful linear relationship. So right here, like that's a very good predictor uh, of how many, if you can predict the number of runs and the number of runs given up, you can fairly decently predict the number of home runs hit. Uh, and again, uh, while this plot looks pretty nice, I would want to give it a title, a subtitle, a caption with the data source, and uh, fix up the labels on the axes so they're human readable, not computer readable. But and there's the time for a video. I'm going to skip that. I'll do it for the post if I haven't already. Okay, so that's like the very, very, very basics of some of this Moneyball stuff. But we live in the year 2023 as I'm recording this video, and technology has come a long way and we have leveraged that to collect more and more data about the game of baseball. So if we uh, take a pause real quick um, to look at this data. So this data is what we would call counting data. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, here are the number of games the player played, the number of bats, the number of runs scored, the number of hits, doubles, triples, home runs, RBI, stolen bases, caught stealing, walks, etc. That's not really interesting. What's really interesting is things like how fast did the pitcher throw that ball? How much spin was there on that ball? Uh, how much did it move? Where did it cross the plate? How hard did the, the batter hit the ball off the bat? What was the angle? How far did it go? Things like that. That's what we care about now. And Major League Baseball cares about that too, and they care so much about it, they release that kind of information to fans. Um, so there's this thing called StatCast. 
Um, so StackCast is sort of the name of the underlying data that supports this kind of stuff. Uh, the website here, this is baseballsavant.mlb.com. This is where you will kind of find their sort of advanced um, data and metrics and stuff. So what we're gonna look at is right here, because again, it's probably clear at this point, I'm a White Sox fan. I'm recording this the day after opening day, but yesterday, this individual, Dylan Cease, threw a gem of a game against the defending World Series champion, um, Houston Astros. Um, but what you'll notice here is that they have some nice visualizations to sort of summarize these things. So here we see the three, or well, four in this case, uh, well, 2022, and that's the data we're going to look at, so that's actually good. So this is the 2022, um, he throws a slider, a fastball, a curveball, and a changeup, and this is the distribution of um, the speed he throws those pitches relative to league average. Um, we're going to make that plot. Um, we also see here a heat map of for his different pitches where they cross the plate. Um, and this is sort of a very important part of analytics these days. So if you're a hitter, you are studying the data of the pitcher you're playing against ahead of time. It's like, okay, where do they like to throw that pitch? Um, and, and the pitcher's doing the same thing against the batter. Ooh, where are they good at hitting it? That's a, more difficult than what we're going to do today. Um, these are actually, these graphics are based on data from yesterday. Um, but we're going to recreate these uh, from his average of last season. One, because these plots are simply a better tool with more data, and he only has one game in 2023, and he had like 30 in 2022. Um, and, uh, well, I prepared for 2022. But as a bonus, uh, excuse me, we'll try to get that uh, 2023 data because we can. Okay, so to do this, we're going to move over to the stat cast thing here. Uh, so I'm going to load, we already loaded the tidyverse. To, to make some of the nice plots I'm about to make, I'm going to need this GG density package um, and this GG ridges package. And I don't know if we're going to need DT, but I might make a table along the way. Okay, cool. So how do we get this data? So um, there's something called search here. And you can sort of put in all of these different parameters here and then click search and you can get yourself a CSV. I don't want to do that. What I want to do is use this package I wrote. Uh, I call it BBD for baseball data. Um, and basically what this is, is this is an R sort of wrapper around the API that is exposed to us via uh, baseball savant. And so basically we can just ask from R, say, hey, give us the data from these days. Um, technically, you could, I, the way you could say, give it to me um, based on these days in this player, but we're gonna kind of collect a lot of data. Um, I should note that this isn't the only package to do this. Um, this baseball R package is the really popular one for doing this. And honestly, I'd probably advise you to use that. The reason I'm showing you BBD is, um, well, one, I wrote it, and I guess I wanted to show you. But more importantly, um, I think BBD, if you look at the source code for it, it's going to be a lot more understandable than the Baseball R package, simply because Baseball R just has a lot more features, which makes it more complicated. Uh, but, but because BBD is pretty lightweight um, and it doesn't have a lot of features currently, it might be sort of understandable to someone who's only had a semester's worth of R. And I say this because it's hosted on GitHub. You can... Uh, browse the source code by clicking here or here. And if you were interested in package development and baseball and wanted to contribute, I would invite you to do that. Have fun, um, make a PR and I'll give you comments. All right, so um, uh, I need to steal a little bit of code from myself. Um, don't mind, oh no, spoilers, that's what we're gonna make. Um, so, okay, so I'm gonna need this. And I'm going to need this. And I'm going to need this. Oh, I'm definitely going to need this because this is code I can't write on the fly. Okay, so what do I, what is all this stuff? Okay, so first of all, I'm going to need something called Dylan Cease's player ID. Um, but how do I get that, right? So within the BBD package, I have this people search function where you give 
uh, sort of a human readable name. And what it's going to do, it's going to do a thing called a fuzzy search, and this is not important. And it's going to give you back uh, a data frame here with various players with similar names. Uh, here's Dylan that we're looking for. And this 656302 is what's called his um, MLB AM ID. Uh, AM here stands for advanced media. Uh, ostensibly, I think that's the group that started like the MLB online streaming stuff, but they're now responsible for collecting the data, I think. Don't quote me on that. I just know it as MLB AM and I know that's the thing I want. So this line of code here, I wanna be really careful and say, feel free to run it, but it will take a long time because what this is gonna do is it's going to acquire a row for every pitch that occurred in the 2022 season. And you might imagine, actually, I'm gonna comment this out to make sure I don't run it. You might imagine that that is a lot of pitches. So feel free to run that, but it's gonna take a while. Um, and then what I'm doing here is I'm filtering to that data that I acquired to Dylan C's the relevant player. I'll comment that out too. And then, and so this here would be a, a data frame. And one of the ways that we haven't talked about yet, but one of the ways you could sort of import and export data is via what's called serialization. So when I click, when I run this save RDS function on that object and then give it this file name, what that does is it creates what's called a .rds file. And what that does is it takes the data frame that you created and writes to a binary format that can be stored on the computer. Um, but it's, it's not using an intermediate exchange format like CSV. It's saying we are gonna store this exact R object on a hard drive. And then I don't need to do that because I already did it. And so what I'm doing here, uh oh, oh, I know my problem. Uh, so this is a working directory issue. So, uh, cause I'm doing everything based on where I am. So I need to be based on file location. Now it'll work. Okay, so basically I am in this uh, Moneyball directory. And so what I did is I set my um, working directory to there and then I'm relative referencing this file here which is all those pitches. Now you're probably thinking, well, like I don't have this SC 2022. I, I wrote that to disk too, but I didn't put the code for it. Like, I don't want to download all that and take forever just to get this Dylan Cease data. Never, never, never worry. That's this file right here. So if you download that and put it within a data folder within the script that you're running, um, you can acquire all that data and then run this. Let's have a look at that data. Okay. Um, actually, I'm gonna run, so what this function here, we'll need this in a bit, this is going to put a strike zone on top of a plot. That's not important, that's just something I need. Uh, so that's there. Uh, credit to um, Jim Albert's uh, blog slash um, package called called strikes. This is a modification of a function he did there. Um, he is, well, he has many things in the baseball analytics world, uh, but he is one of the authors of this book called Analyzing Baseball Data with R. Highly recommended if you wanna get into this kind of thing. And it's also um, kind of like the stuff we're doing here. It'll go through a lot of this kind of stuff, which will give you a lot of practice sort of wrangling data and whatnot. Also shout out to something that we'll talk about later, which is Stat430, a topics course um, about baseball analytics where uh, Jim Albert has, I believe, been a guest speaker. Um, so more on that later though. Okay, cool. So I loaded that. All right, so let's look at this data I'm talking about. Cease 2022. Okay, so it's a lot of data, but like I said, what a row of this data set is, is an individual pitch that occurred during the 2022 season. Um, they're not necessarily in any sort of order, although uh, you have information to recreate the order. So actually let's, um, let's pull up a data viewer around this so I can sort of talk through some of it. Um, on that StatCast search site that we were on briefly, uh, if you click here, uh, it'll take you to, it'll take you to some documentation about this data, but I'll sort of walk you through it real quick. So here is the pitcher that threw the ball. Here is the batter name. Uh, so the, ooh, uh, Miguel Cabrera, uh, the pitch type. So in baseball pitch type just means like, um, it's categorizations of pitches based on sort of, um, well, what the pitch, there's types of pitches. So there's fastballs that go straight and fast. 
There are curveballs that go uh, slow and kind of loopy. There are sliders that are kind of faster and kind of like sweep at the end, sinkers that kind of go straight and then die at the end, stuff like that. I should add to the post um, a thing about one, a game to play to test, can you do that very well? And two, if you're new to that kind of thing, um, how to sort of like understand that as a watcher of the game. I'm gonna make baseball fans of folks that aren't baseball fans. Okay, how fast was the pitch? Um, where was his arm when he released it? Um, oh, I should get rid of this. Um, that doesn't need to be there. Uh, th these two columns are not necessarily in the data directly from StatCast. I'm using a function that kind of does some processing as well, but uh, more on that if you're interested. Okay, what actually happened as a result of that pitch necessarily? Um, but the interesting stuff is, um, again, there's all sorts of stuff. Who was the home team? Who was the away team? Here is some of the interesting stuff. So this is how much movement on the horizontal axis did it have? Here is how much vertical movement did it have? Um, so this pitch, um, it seemed like it, it moved uh, side to side, like almost a foot and it dropped like three quarters of a foot. I think this is in feet. I should, I should know these things. Um, here are the coordinates where it crossed the strike zone. Um, and then there's other things like, um, here's some velocity, uh, where's the, oh, this is the, actually the top and bottom of the strike zone for the individual batter. We're gonna ignore that uh, for reasons. Um, wait, did I find, uh, oh yeah, so if it got hit, launch angle and exit velocity, but uh, where is, um, I missed, I, I, I breezed over some of the more important variables, wait, Where is it? Oh, I always forget that you got to go further in. <laughs> they don't actually show you all the columns at once. So, aha. Um, there's multiple speeds. I usually use release speed. That's in here somewhere, but release spin rate. So one of the most important things about a pitch that makes it hard to hit is how fast it spins. Um, and if you've been following baseball, this has been important recently um, because long story short, for those of you who don't have to watch baseball, um, oh, normally I have like a prop baseball, but anyway, so long story short, the way you throw a baseball as a pitcher is you kind of, you, you, you throw it, again, I'm not doing my whole throwing motion here because I'm kind of constrained by space and I don't want to hit the microphone, but it's important to sort of put spin on it. So you, you kind of flick it with your fingertips at the end and Baseballs, at least the ones made by Rawlings for MLB, are kind of slick, so it's hard to do that. So what I'm about to say sounds, sounds wild, but it's true. To deal with the fact that they're kind of slick before the game, for all the balls that are going to be used, they muddy the balls. And what I mean is they take actual mud and rub it onto the balls to give them a little tack and grip. This mud is sourced by one individual from one secret location and is shipped to all 30 baseball stadiums. I am not kidding, you can look this up. How do other baseball organizations deal with this, like the KBO and the NPB? They just make a ball with more tack. But instead, Major League Baseball literally has someone rub mud onto the baseballs. So obviously there's some variance there, but pitchers realized that the stickier the ball is and the stickier their hands is, that last bit where it comes off their fingers is more effective. So what did pitchers start doing? They started putting all manner of sticky stuff on their fingers, up to and including basically glue. And uh, over the last couple seasons, it's become, this has become a whole thing and it got banned and they're checking for it. And we might do another sort of video about this sort of like, basically this bit of data right here, we could use this to find the people that were doing that more than other people. But you know what? I should definitely do it. Wait, I have a video on that. I'll release it later. Um, Cause I make an app based on that to demonstrate the final exam, not final exam, final project, but anyway, we're gonna look at these sorts of things. Okay, so cool. But basically, instead of simple things like counting statistics for a season, we now have information about every pitch that occurs. 
kind of cool. Okay, so what do I want to do with that? So I sort of said that, well, the first thing we'll do is we'll do a really quick uh, thing. So Dylan Cease. So um, let's do a summarize n equals n dot by uh, pitch type. Okay, so here are the number of the different pitch types that he threw. And actually to help us out here, so for whatever reason, in the baseball analytics world, it, it became commonplace to talk about pitch type because I know that, for example, this is a slider, this is a sinker, this is a four seam fastball, this is a change up, this is a knuckle curve. We'll talk about the NA in a second because I don't know, people like short things, but for those of you that are not pitcher name, we know it's Dylan Cease, they're all Dylan Cease, pitch name. So, um, in the data set is the actual names of the pitches too. Like I said, slider, sinker, four seam, fastball, change up, knuckle curve. Um, I don't know why people like the, the two letter short code, but I'll use both for, well, most of the people that are interested in baseball, but you can't keep all the pitches type straight and, and for those that don't. Now, why are there NAs? Because for example, um, in addition to the pitch data, there are other discrete actions that happen in a game of baseball, like trying to pick someone off at first base. And those are also recorded. Uh, so there's no pitch type for those because there was no pitch type thrown. So what I want to do, for example, is say filter uh, is in a pitch type. So that's just getting rid of all those non pitches. And then what we'll do just really quickly for fun is say ggplot. Uh, and then, so on the x-axis, we're going to put uh, release speed. And then um, on the y-axis, we're going to put uh, release spin rate. Uh, what did I say? Uh, and then let's plot those uh, as points. There's a lot of them, so it'll take a second. Okay, and something you might notice right away is like, hey, there's like, three to four distinct blobs here. And again, much like wiggle, blob is also a, a, a pseudo-technical term we use sometimes in statistics. But what are those blobs? Well, if we were to, I always forget if it's color or fill, uh, pitch type, right? Wait, hold up. No, it's color. I, You know, someday I'll learn these things. Okay, and I'm not actually a fan of that color scheme. So let's do uh, scale color brewer. Uh, how about set one, I think is decent. And then let's do uh, theme white. Okay, cool. Why am I showing this? Um, so, well, one, so you can see that sort of the different pitch types um, can sort of largely be understood based on two characteristics. That is how fast it travels and how much spin it has when it travels. And so if you know anything about machine learning, you can look at this and say, well, hey, now I could fit a classifier that classifies this data probably like 90% plus without any issue. Um, this, uh, these uh, sinkers here look like fastballs and that makes sense if you know anything about baseball. But um, yeah, so if you've ever watched a baseball broadcast and you've you've seen how like they so very quickly throw up the pitch type, I'm not 100% sure of this, but what I'm pretty sure is happening is they get this data in real time and they have a model for each player. They run it through it, it spits out the uh, pitch type. So for those of you that have made it an hour and five minutes into this video, I'll drop a little promise. If anyone makes it this far and cares about this and asks me about it, I will do a video about creating a pitch classifier as a shiny application. Someone hold me to that, but only if you watch 105 minutes or uh, an hour and five minutes of this video and care. Okay, cool. What, but what I said is I wanted to oh, go back to Dylan Cease. I want to make this graphic and I want to make these graphics. Okay. So for the first one, we can start from here. Um, and this is actually really easy. Do to, well, you know, easy is relative. So on the X axis, we want velocity, right? Okay, so that is uh, 
release speed. Because generally, it's my understanding that when you're watching a broadcast and they show you the, excuse me, speed, it's based on right when it comes out of the pitcher's hand. Excuse me. There's also something called effective speed because um, you could also think of speed as, because you know there's acceleration to it. And well, and deceleration over time, right? But you could think about speed as here's the plate, here's where it leaves the pitcher's hand. You know, we know the distance and the time, you could give the speed that way. I think that's what effective speed is. And the trick there is if you're a taller pitcher, your arm extends further so it appears faster. And that's why pitchers like Randy Johnson were absolutely terrifying to go up against. Um, okay, but then on the y axis, we want the pitch type. Um, I'll use pitch name because it'll make our life easier. Um, preemptively, I'm going to set color to be that as well, although I don't know if that's going to work out correctly. And then what I'm going to do is use um, geome density, I think, uh, density ridges. So this is where I needed this GG ridges package from. And it's going to create, in my opinion, a pretty nice plot if I've done it correctly. And I want to set the theme right away. Cool. Ah, uh, it's Phil. I, someday I'll remember these things. Um, okay, cool. So there it is, basically. Um, you might notice, though, there's a bit of a difference between what we have here and what they have on uh, Baseball Savant. And what I'm guessing is happening is they're rolling uh, four-seam fastball and sinker into just fastball because those are technically just two types of fastball. Dylan Cease is apparently throwing it on average 97 miles an hour. We should verify that. Um, and they also seem to be making the density bigger or smaller based on how often that pitch is actually thrown. Because, uh, for example, he doesn't throw very many change-ups. Um, I'm guessing it's actually only like four or five pitches here. But hey! Well, you know what? In the interest of time, because this video is going long, let me steal a little bit of code from myself. Um... So here is a ton, well, we don't really need to hear actually. Um, so if I run this, this gets me quick sort of summary information. Um, okay, so he threw 76 changeups, but still not very many relative to some of the other pitches. And we hear, here we see his four seam fastball. Yes, they're correct. On average, it was about 97 miles per hour with uh, 2,500 uh, RPM. Uh, I forget the exact metric, the unit there. Okay, but anyway, now for the coolest graphic of them all. Um, okay, yeah, so we'll start here. Okay, so we want to we want to do this, which is our version of this. Okay, and actually, in the interest of time, I'm going to cheat. Um, I'll talk through this, but let's just cheat. Okay, so what do we have going on here? So we're taking his data. Oh, because the distribution is going to be pretty affected by if it's a right-handed batter or this is awkward for me a left-handed batter because you're going to throw to different sides of the plate based on that because you're trying to strike the guy out we'll only look at right-handed hitters the more common ignoring na's then piping the gg plot too so this variable is where it crosses on the x-axis this is the horizontal i don't know why it's z instead of y it just is um so this geome hdr that is from this gg density package uh, and what that is going to do is sort of do our version of uh, these sort of like heat map-ish type things, except uh, the way I'm doing it is so the lightest one will show you where 95% of the pitches are, and the darkest one will show you where 5% of the pitches are, and these probabilities in between, and that'll actually appear on the legend. So this geome strike zone is this thing I created earlier that will place the strike zone on the plot, um, then in addition to the sort of heat, we're also going to put the, um, actual pitches and we'll toggle that on and off to see what it looks like. Uh, a little bit of theming, a little bit of messing with the theme, uh, changing colors. And then what I'm doing here is to create one for each pitch. We're using faceting. Cool. All right, let's run that. It looks like that. Um, for the record, if we turned off the points... Uh, it would look kind of like that, which is cool. Um, again, we're not, well, here, let's, wait, what? Okay, yeah, so ours look a little bit different, but I would argue 
that at least we know exactly what ours means because I'm telling you um, sort of what probabilities are there. Cool, okay, but so for fun now, let's put this back. Okay, so what I wanna do is, this was 2022 data, but baseball happened yesterday. Again, I'm recording this on uh, March 31st, 2023. Opening day was March 30th, 2023. Dylan Cease threw against the Houston Astros. It was the primetime game. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna use the BBD package. We're gonna use the StatCast um, function. In particular, we're gonna use this StatCast BBD function. And what that does is rather than uh, exactly just pulling the data exactly as it was, it's gonna do minimal pre-processing. We don't have time to talk about that. If you're interested, let me know. Um, and so we just wanna do start date of, what did I say? Because uh, we use the correct date format. So like this, 03, 30. Uh, we'll call this StatCast uh, opening day 2023. Okay, so what that's doing is it's talking to uh, the MLB um, StatCast API, and hopefully this doesn't take too long. It's gonna give me back all of that. Oh no, oh no. That's the last thing I wanna have happen after an hour and 10 minutes of doing this. Can't subset, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's do this. Um, in the interest of, I'm guessing it's my pre-processing that's broken, so I'm gonna use the more basic function and that works just fine. Um, so the issue here is gonna be um, that these are, okay, so the, the, the pre-processing that I do is I give you both the batter and pitcher name. Oh, it's really annoying that that's broken and I haven't messed with 2023 data. I wonder if they changed something in it and that's why it's broken. I'm not gonna debug that on the fly, but thankfully we know which pitcher is Dylan Cease. So what we can do is we can say StatCast opening day 2023, and then we can say filter to uh, pitcher equals two because uh, his ID will not change this number here. Okay, cool. Oh, right. So um, this is something that is part of this data set, which is that when you when you request it, and this is one of the reasons I do the pre-processing, and I, th so this function is extremely faithful to the original data that it gives you back. And for whatever reason, it gives you back multiple columns with the same name. And I don't mess with them unless you specifically request uh, me to do that with the package. So uh, before we do any sort of filtering, we're gonna need to do some subsetting and only take one uh, version of that. So bear with me. So we're gonna need this data like this. Uh, and then we'll also want pitch type. And then like this. Really? Wait, can I not do this? Um, that's really annoying. Wait, hold on. What was the issue it was getting? X must be a logical numerical character and not. Huh. Yeah, I can't debug that on the fly. Oh no, this is going to be a really bad way to end the video. Um, wait, let's do this. Pitcher, okay, so let's request just cease. So we'll call this cease opening 2023 because that's a thing we can do. And then let's look at that. Does that still give me, it, it's still gonna give me the duplicate names, although now it does have it by pitcher, uh, but that's already subsetted, so that's nice. Um, uh, can I do, I think if I run this thing that's already a tibble through as tibble, and then I forget how to do this, but there is an argument called name repair and let's use it. This is annoying, but hey, this is the real world. Um, also, this means that, because you know, my I've used 
that package a bunch, but never on 2023 data, literally until today. So I don't know what's going wrong. So if you're interested, let me know and we can maybe work on that together. Uh, I think if I do this, yeah. So what it, what essentially what that's doing is it's like appending like underscore one to the duplicate names. So let's override this. So now I should be able to, yeah, it even tells me what those things are. Yeah, because for whatever reason, it duplicates these things. But I should be able to very simply now, actually, I think, honestly, we should just be able to take the code we already have because it's already, it's already filtered to cease. It has all the right stuff in it. It just works, except for let's turn off this because that was me sort of messing with um, the location of the legend, but that changed based on the fact that the faceting and there weren't as many things. Um, so this should more or less be this. Uh, so here's his knuckle curve, which they're calling a curve that, you know, you know, they're visualizing it differently, but it's definitely doing the same stuff. Uh, here's the four seam. We sort of see the heat in the same area and the slider, you know, we see it a lot of it out of the zone down and away. Same thing here. So there's that. Pretty cool, huh? Okay. Oh, I'm getting tired. All right. So, um, right. Sorry. Two things. One, hopefully that... Uh, gives you some idea of how sort of like people actually use dplyr, ggplot2, tidyr, things like that day to day to accomplish things. Two, you're probably realizing that I enjoy working with this type of data. And at the University of Illinois, I am not the only one. So something that I started doing in this post, although I need to do more of, is mentioning a few things about baseball here at Illinois. So allow me to take five minutes at the end of this horribly long video to mention it. So I'm guessing the people that are still watching are the folks that are actually interested in baseball. So let me tell you about a few things. Oh, why did this not render correctly? But anyway, we can get over that. Okay, so. Oh, I need an HTTPS there, but hey, I know how to fix that. Okay, so here is a website for my colleague, Dan Eck. Uh, the Eck Lab, uh, of which I guess I'm technically a member. Um, so he is a professor in the Department of Statistics um, doing many things, but one of the things that he's very interested in is baseball analytics. Um, and he has a couple projects ongoing, uh, one of which is this website here. Um, so what this is, is this is an attempt to allow for fair comparison of players across different eras of baseball. So if you're familiar with baseball, um, you know, players today play against the best talent in the world for the most part. I mean, obviously there's still some restrictions and some biases, but for a long time, baseball was segregated. So when you have a player like Babe Ruth, who is, you know, no matter what, one of the best of all time, he wasn't playing against all the potential talent in the world. So how do you deal with this? So Dan, together with a history professor, Adrian Burgos, uh, they came up with this um, sort of system for attempting to uh, unbias these things. And so if you're a baseball fan and you want to start arguments about who's the best player of all time, here you go. I will say that it does not adjust for performance enhancing drugs usage. That's harder to do because we don't know who didn't, who did not. Um, but they did some. They do some interesting things around populations, um, uh, like the, like Earth population at various times in various places, and interest in baseball in those places, and who was allowed to and who was not allowed to play at various times. It's a very interesting um, project. Um, a project that I'm involved with with Dan is this thing called Seam, uh, and what we're attempting to do here is um, for a specific batter pitcher matchup. If the ball gets hit into play, where is it going to go? Um, and basically, um, this overcomes an issue of low sample size. Um, and if you ever watch a broadcast, normally they show you kind of like what's called like the spray chart, but that's for a batter specifically. What we're talking about is not just what the batter does on average, but what a batter does against a specific pitcher. And we have sort of an application for that. If you click anywhere here, it'll take you to that and you can have some fun with it. Okay, cool. Um, so I think this website is down and that's really disappointing. So 
It was, it was literally working yesterday. Um, so uh, Professor Alan Nathan over in physics um, has been doing baseball type stuff for before I started here at Illinois, um, I think, I'm guessing. Um, he's obviously more interested in the physics side of thing as what you would suggest by uh, baseball.physics.illinois.edu. Um, he has collaborated with, I think MLB directly when they were worried about there were too many home runs. And he had, I forget the name of the report, but I believe he's one of the co-authors of the report that sort of suggested maybe what was going on with the combination of the balls and other things. Um, yeah. Um, and then a few news articles here that we'll talk through really quickly um, that are posted on the stat website. So this is to let you know that stat 430 baseball analytics exists sometime. Unfortunately, I think it's not happening in the fall, uh, but that is a course taught by Dan. Uh, I guess a lecture in that course, but again, more interesting than just me guest lecturing is folks like Jim Albert have guest lectured um, and, I'll, and, and and people from within MLB organizations, uh, other people from within the analytics space, um, uh, the people from within a in academia. It's a, it's a really interesting course if you're interested in baseball. Okay. Um, then um, here is a note about uh, one of my former colleagues, a uh, former member of the Department of Statistics, Essen Bokari. He is now an assistant general manager for the Chicago Cubs. Uh, prior, he spent time with the, uh, originally the Dodgers and then the Astros, and now he's with the Cubs. He is also someone that has come and guest lectured in the uh, baseball analytics course. So if you're interested in breaking into uh, baseball analytics and working for a baseball organization, these are the type of people that you want to meet and that class is an opportunity to do so. Um, this is a piece about a student. Uh, one of, it was, it was, yeah, He was my student once. He was Al Nathan's students previously, Charlie Young. Um, he has worked with Dan and I on that seam methodology we talked about prior, uh, and he is now, a, what, what is his title? Quantitative developer with the Houston Astros. Uh, but he is one of a growing number of students that have worked with myself, Dan and Alan that are working for MLB organizations. Um, there are a growing number of Illini out in, uh, baseball analytics. So again, if that's the kind of thing that you're interested in, um, yeah. There are people doing that kind of work here and you just got to kind of find out when they're doing it. Oh, and this is a, this is the article about, um, the full house model. Sorry. Uh, the, the adjusting across eras kind of thing. Uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing somewhere in here, I hope they mentioned that. Did they not? Uh, so long story short, um, Adrian and Dan went on the fan graphs podcast called effectively wild to discuss it there. Uh, if you're into baseball and podcasts, I highly recommend Effectively Wild, uh, but in particular, the episode where Dan and Adrian talk about their method. It's kind of a, it was, it was super cool for me. It was like, wait, because that's just a podcast that I listen to. And then I was like, oh, wait, that, that's Dan. I, I talk to him like every day. That's so cool. Um, so there's that. Um, but yeah, I'll clean this up a little bit and, uh, you know, put additional resources here. Oh, I, because I can't find their website right now. Uh, there's a group on campus called Alina Analytics. They do sort of in-house analytics for the men's baseball team here at the University of Illinois. That group was actually started by the aforementioned Charlie Young, uh, but it has continued on uh, since he's graduated and they're still uh, assisting the team. So we're, we're using these sorts of things here at Illinois to assist um, the baseball team. So again, if that's the kind of thing you're interested in, I would highly recommend getting in touch with those folks and maybe trying to join. I don't know if they're looking for more people. I but you know, you might want to go talk to them. Okay. Rambling. This has been a long video. I understand, but hopefully you got something out of it, especially if um, you're a baseball person. Uh, I promise I won't do too much baseball along the way, but some things I can't help myself because they're, they're like the base, the, the data is readily available and um, it, it just lends itself to so many cool applications really quickly. Then that's just where my, my mind goes these days. Breathe. Okay, cool. Sorry. All right. So um, again, I think I sprinkled a few like, hey, if you want to know more, let me know. Um, post on the discussion forum, say, like, hey, let's talk about that thing you talked about. Because um, uh, I don't want to just do baseball, 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 unless there are people truly interested. And to those of you that don't care about baseball, I promise I won't do too much more. Okay. So hopefully this recording worked. Hopefully it didn't like get corrupt on me an hour ago and I should have stopped, but assuming it worked. As always, if you made it to the end of the video, good job.